Uh, welcome to our second uh, small talks regarding big data. Uh, tonight we have uh, Dr. Dave uh, Belanger, who is a uh, senior research fellow here at uh, Stevens, and uh, he's going to be talking to us about the uh, uh, about an application view on big data. So, with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Chris. Um, if you have questions, please ask them while I'm talking. That way, neither you nor I have to remember what I was saying at the time that uh, uh, the question came up. So I think uh, anybody who's, who's been looking in the trade journals or the professional publications in data analysis or, or the uh, data management world has heard a lot about big data. And you hear about things like uh, size, velocity, volume, uh, variety, the characteristics of the data. You hear about uh, the tools that are used in this. But one of the things that um, at least I seldom see is some kind of sense of what you can do with this stuff that you couldn't do with, uh, with data maybe a decade ago because of the confluence of, one, the amount of data, uh, and the tools available for uh, working with it. Uh, the pictures you see behind you are um, some indication of what effect scale has. Very often it's the case that something that you see that can be done in the small, for instance with seven uh, nodes and, and a few edges, um, the thought process carries over to the very large but it's qualitatively and quantitatively different in terms of the ways that you can address this. So if you look at the middle picture, there are only a 1,000 nodes, but that picture doesn't tell you very much. Fortunately, uh, the system it's in allows for uh, interactive uh, reduction of the number of points, so you can improve it. Um, the bottom uh, right picture from your point of view is a few hundred thousand nodes. It's actually uh, all of the edge routers on the internet. And uh, it also is interactive so that you can, um, you can point to any particular router and uh, see its characteristics, see who it's connected to, et cetera. But the techniques and the technology for thinking about the one, the latter, is completely different from thinking about the former. So if you were to try and do the usual graph kinds of things, uh, connectedness, reachability, they become, uh, well, the algorithms that you might use in the, uh, in the small are completely different from the algorithms that you would use in, in the large. And so basically, the kinds of things you can do very often you can think about, it's easy to think about doing them in the small. Uh, it's therefore easy to think about what you're doing. Actually doing it becomes uh, quite a challenge. So this is just an overview of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, basically the, uh, the game is that you have a lot of data in the middle and the characteristics of the data are by far the most important thing. Uh, this isn't a game that you can play without data. Around that are a collection of uh, tools and techniques, uh, basically four kinds. One is networking. Uh, data doesn't usually start out life where you are, so you have to find a way to get it to you. Um, second is computer science, largely data management, the computer science of scale things like compression, parallelization, uh, distribution, especially in big data parallelization. If you were to look at most of the tools that have derived over the past um, decade to handle data of the size that you see on the web, you would see that they are typically not done on mainframes. They're typically done on large banks of small computers, essentially shared nothing but very, very parallel. Uh, MapReduce being, MapReduce and the tool Hadoop being the most well-known of these things. Uh, analysis, for the most part, uh, analysis has moved from uh, 
looking at samples where there are large data sets and trying to make inferences, statistical inferences from samples, um, and looking at very aggregate uh, kinds of statistics to trying to do things in an individual way. And I'll, I'll talk a little more about this when I talk about how things are done. It's not entirely true. Uh, so from my experience, um, while at at and uh, there are order of uh, 10 uh, billion messages and calls a day. That's quite a few, but it's completely handleable by, at an individual level by uh, uh, big data techniques. On the other hand, there are a few hundred trillion packets a day. Uh, analysis on the content of packets is, of course, not done. But uh, a few hundred trillion packet headers a day is beyond the capability of, um, of existing computing uh, technology. So there are still reasons for learning sampling. There are still reasons for doing aggregates. It's just that the kinds of things you can do on much larger data sets has, um, has changed. Um, in addition, uh, analysis is very fast going to real-time analysis, and the, uh, the game in real-time analysis is that you get to look at a window and have to make a decision based on the data that's in that window. Uh, I'll mention some examples of that in a while. And finally, visualization. So those of you who uh, uh, were at the last small talk got a fairly long discussion of visualization. I won't uh, be, uh, be spending any more uh, anywhere near that amount of time on it, but the, the point of visualization is that it's what causes people to act. Humans are still the best visual pattern recognition engines in the world. Uh, computers will catch up in a matter of a few years. Um, they caught up to us in speech, um, I think, already. But if you want to understand data and you can create a good visual image, uh, it's by far the best way to do it. The trick is that it's as much art as it is science, understanding what a good visual image of some uh, domain is. And finally, around the outside is the point of doing all of this. A variety of applications across a number of different uh, industries. Most industries that uh, generate a lot of data are involved in this in one way or another. Many industries, finance, uh, communications, for instance, have been involved in it for well over a decade. Some, like uh, healthcare and the uh, energy folks, are just starting to generate these, uh, these levels of data. And by level of data, basically, um, the rough definition of, of big data is that it's too big for normal commercial tools to handle gracefully, which at this point is, uh, is pretty big. So structure of what I'm going to do is talk about things that can be done um, in a big data environment and are done and give you examples of the kinds of uh, applications where they're applied. And, um, the first, and by far the most common example of, uh, of use of big data, is on sparse data sets. So if you think about what um, all of the search companies are doing, and you see a, a list of some number of search companies down there, they're uh, returning to you sometimes a lot of data, but a minuscule amount of data given the size of the data set that they're looking at, which is essentially the, um, the web. And so the analytic techniques are actually fairly simple. They're uh, MapReduce and they're um, essentially doing pattern recognition to, uh, at, at the simplest level, pattern recognition to match what your query is. As uh, they've become more sophisticated, they've uh, enhanced the way they do pattern recognition. But it means that this can be done uh, with dramatic parallelization. You spread it over a lot of, um, of computers. You feed the data in. That's the map part of MapReduce. Uh, the results come out, and you uh, reduce them to the answer that comes back to you. So the idea is, with, with normal uh, database technology, normal meaning um, prior to uh, big data and, and MapReduce, the um, 
idea of searching a database that's on the order of uh, tens of petabytes was just not an option. They were optimized for uh, key access, i.e. you know the key and you want to get a fairly small set of data out of that. Uh, search through them uh, could be done, but most people would have found that uh, just using files uh, would have been more effective for that and uh, searching through a few uh, hundred terabytes or a few petabytes was not an option. So uh, search or other uh, activities that are done on very large collections of data looking for a fairly small but not uh, individually identifiable uh, result is, is something that uh, essentially has driven most of the technology, most of the data technology in big data and it's the canonical example of use of it. Uh, today, uh, we can do search on speech as well as text at the order of a few million uh, calls per day um, and uh, search on uh, video and image, but at a much smaller level, that technology hasn't evolved quite as fast. <coughs> the other uh, fairly basic um, change is that on very large data sets, we can have individual precision. So you see this every time you uh, go on the web, there are um, ads that are targeted to you. Not to some group that they hope you might be a member of, but actually to you based on your behavior in using um, a search engine or email or whatever it is you happen to be using. So one side of uh, individual precision is the, um, the input side, you can look at individuals, for instance, uh, a customer record, customer interaction record over a um, hundred million customers, a couple hundred million customers, where that customer interaction record is every time that customer touches your company. So if they call customer service, if they pay a bill, if they use your service, that's a, a linear record and you can do this for every um, every customer you have. For those of you interested in um, boundaries of technology, this does bring up uh, an issue which is fairly hard to deal with. And that is if you have a string of interactions that you've had with a, um, a company and you would like to look for a pattern within it, um, there are not right now good query languages beyond regular expressions that allow you to specify, I'd like to see all the instances across my customers of these patterns. For instance, called customer care, said they had a problem with some product uh, called billing and um, then attempted to use the service. Whatever that um, pattern might be, um, right now, uh, regular expressions are about as good as uh, you can use at very large scale on this. The second kind of uh, individual precision gets to what's called misuse there, and in uh, my case it's misuse of, of telecommunications. People would uh, think of it very often as fraud, but there are varieties of ways of, of misusing uh, communication. and. The standard way of, uh, of identifying misuse, so think of this, every phone call that's made uh, is measured for whether it's likely to be a fraud call or not. In the IP world, it's called security and uh, the uh, volumes are way too large for doing it on every packet, so every session would be identified and, and uh, you would attempt to discover whether there was misuse going on. Um, the normal way of dealing with this uh, a decade ago would be to use thresholds. So if you saw a uh, call that lasted 15 minutes to a location that typically um, uh, provided uh, pornography calls or something like that, it's probably going to be a, a fraudster. They're probably not going to want to pay for it. Uh, the result of that though is that uh, security attackers and, and uh, fraudsters are pretty smart folks. And so what you see is a lot of um, 14 and a half minute calls 
to those locations. And yeah, you can go down to 14 minutes, same thing will happen. So uh, one of the things that, uh, that big data has allowed to, us to do is not only have the input be individual, that's been going on for a lot of years, as it would be in the customer record, but have the metric be individual. So that for each uh, phone number in this case, for each IP address, uh, in the financial world for each account number or each transaction number, um, there would be a signature of how that transaction is expected to behave and if it behaves differently, then you get an alarm. So I'm sure you've experienced with your uh, credit cards, well maybe you haven't experienced it, but you know it happens, that with your credit cards, if you use them in a way that doesn't fit the signature of the way your credit card is expected to be used, you'll get an alert. Uh, and uh, in some cases, you'll uh, not be allowed to complete the transaction. So this is a big difference between uh, just knowing the individual doing the transaction and having a metric that fits that, that individual. And uh, that's um, only been, well, in, in finance and communications over the last uh, decade, in other industries far more recent and, uh, and just evolving. Uh, one um, application of, of this that um, I was exposed to last um, Thursday, uh, and uh, I would guess that most of you have been exposed to, and it's not solved, is uh, robocalling. So if you, any of you have received a call from um, a marketing department of something or other, or even a, a phishing call or whatever, uh, with an automated voice on it, Essentially, that's robocalling. They're generated in the millions. And um, right now, there is not a known way to detect a robocall with, uh, with any degree of certainty. The uh, reason is that um, you know, I've just said that you can look at the individual coming in and you can have an individual metric going out. What's happened in robocalling is you can spoof the telephone number coming in and it goes to uh, millions of people on the outbound side. So uh, if you want a problem to solve, robocalling would be a good, good one to do, and the uh, government, not to mention all of the people who are being awakened in the middle of the afternoon in their naps, would, would be very thankful. Um, apparently, there is a, there's been a huge collection of calls uh, by somebody named Rachel. Uh, I don't, has anybody gotten a call from Rachel? Hopefully none of you are named Rachel and, and calling your friends. But um, this uh, Rachel is a, a, a pseudonym, a, a, a taped conversation to try and determine whether there's a human connected to the phone number they're calling. And if there is a human connected to the phone number they're calling, then they can sell that number to robocallers uh, uh, to try to do marketing to you. So uh, those are the most common and most straightforward uh, uses of data that are in some sense new. Um, the next set, uh, paths, graphs, and uh, relationships is a far more powerful approach, but uh, it's lots bigger than big data is. So. Basically, the idea is everyone is familiar with what graphs are, right? That they have nodes and edges. Um, and there are many things that occur naturally as graphs explicitly. Think Facebook, a uh, social network is, is a graph. Uh, there are many things that uh, occur implicitly as graphs. So think of the uh, graph of all of the people you call and who call you, and uh, transitively, all of the people they call and who call them, et cetera. Um, and there are things that are um, inferentially graphs. So think about recommender systems, um, trying to determine what, um, what television shows or what movies you might want to watch. 
it's not uh, directly a graph because you haven't watched uh, all of them, nor are you directly connected to the people who might have. But you can certainly infer, and uh, Amazon does this, Netflix does that, uh, Zappos does that for shoes, what, uh, what you might like to uh, have. So the reason that this is uh, larger is, well, if you're multiplying two matrices together, uh, and uh, you're, in the worst case, somewhere around an n-cubed algorithm. So uh, if you have 100 um, nodes, then you have 100 cubed, not too bad. What's that, a million? Uh, and um, that's manageable. But if you started out with 100 million, that number grows pretty quickly. The good news is that uh, these are generally very, very sparse. So if you were to think of the, um, the size of the number of people who you call or call you compared to the size of the number of telephones in the country, it's most likely small, unless you're one of these robocallers, and then it's, then it's fairly large. Uh, since it's sparse, it, c it can be done in uh, less than n squared. But still, with, uh, with 100 million or so instances, the, uh, that number gets to be very, very large. It typically has to be done with, uh, with heuristics. It typically can't be done uh, with, a, with a brute force algorithm. But what kind of things can you do with this, which is the exciting part of this? Well, um, first of all, let's start uh, down here. This is a um, collection of um, oncologists, uh, essentially cancer uh, doctors. And the idea in this uh, particular application is to identify those amongst them who um, prescribe drugs for certain kinds of cancers and see how they're related. So as to take a subgraph out of the uh, original graph. Fairly straightforward and not too dynamic but uh, still very large numbers. Um, this one is more inferential. So the idea is to try and see if we can discover the patterns of traffic through a city uh, by looking at um, the data being thrown off by cell towers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about privacy uh, later on. But if you look at cell towers only, then you're looking at fairly large and fairly aggregate numbers. Uh, privacy isn't too much of a problem. Uh, the idea, though, is that you're, you're trying to identify a path, in this case through space, uh, in other cases through corporate processes, that uh, can be identified by the data that you're seeing. And, and in this case, you can do a pretty good job of identifying the flows and the size of flows in a moderate-sized uh, New Jersey city, a little bit west of us. If we go beyond that to um, this, and this is um, a canonical application of this is uh, telephone calling. So it's an individual is a node, and uh, who they call, who calls them, a couple generations out. Then you can get past the problem of uh, having, having to know the individual before you make decisions of whether something is, um, is going wrong. Uh, for example, if you wanted to identify whether uh, two telephone numbers were really the same person or the same machine, so think in robocalling, you can spoof a phone number so you don't know uh, whether it's two phone numbers are actually the same. Uh, you can't find that out by the properties of the nodes, at least the data you have on the properties of the nodes. So how would you do it? Well, if you had only the people in this room, how would you do it? Any guesses? OK. Well. Uh, it's fairly simple with only the people in this room. It's, uh, you're probably going to end up calling the same people 
from both phones, unless you're really sophisticated. So if, uh, if you call your um, grandmother, you're probably going to do it from wherever you are, uh, whoever else you call. So what you can do is you can look at the graph and determine whether the graphs are the same. And you can therefore, uh, in many cases, determine with very high accuracy, probability up in the high 90s, whether these two things are the same. And uh, of course, the, uh, the financial industry is, is doing this uh, as well with, uh, with credit cards and uh, with, with uh, financial transactions. So the notion here is that uh, the graph can tell you things about the nodes uh, if you know what the edges are. Uh, it's just that the numbers get very big very fast. Next to last, this is actually a map that you can't see. Not intentionally, it's just too small, of television shows. And it's divided up into countries by uh, television shows which are related by the groups of people who watch them. So it turns out there's a, a country there called Left Bank for people who watch, uh, what is it, MSNBC News. Um, and there's a right bank for people who watch Fox News. And there's a bunch of uh, shows around that. Uh, it turns out that um, the uh, handyman type channels are more closely related to the uh, Fox News channels. Um, but what you can do with this, the applications of it are that if uh, there's a show that uh, you would like to attach to their demographics, advertise to their demographics, but you can't um, get an ad slot, a te television slot on that show, you have the uh, shows that are related to this. Its basic function, however, is to recommend to you what shows you're likely to watch based on the behavior of people who behave towards their television as you do. And this would be inferential, whereas um, these are inferred, these are um, implicit, you develop the networks. These are not networks at all, not graphs at all, but you infer what the graph should be. And finally, there are a few social networking sites out there. Um, that's a, a list of, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them. Uh, Facebook is the poster child for them. And this is explicit networking. There's a, a whole lot of information they can find out from you, about you that you didn't even put in to the social network that are a result of not what you know, but the structure of the uh, relationships that you have. And um, Google is currently working very hard on uh, techniques to, uh, to very quickly, and not Google, uh, Facebook, working very hard on techniques and, and software to very quickly analyze networks of, uh, of enormous size. Uh, not there yet, but uh, we can expect it uh, fairly soon. Well, uh, prototypes are being used internally uh, to them, and hopefully it will become open source. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Question. On that one slide where you're showing the, uh, the relationships with the different colors that looks like a country, right here in the bottom. This one, yeah. 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 Um, it, the implication of looking at that is that there aren't television shows that are universally liked by everyone. Is that, am I drawing the right conclusion from yeah. that slide? Well, uh, so at, at some level, uh, yes. I mean, so the, it depends on the strength of liking. Okay. So if you make liked weak enough, yeah, certain shows are going to be liked by everyone. Right. But if, if you cause it to be stronger, essentially this is um, uh, something like simulated annealing. Uh, so uh, it's physics. If you put a, a spring between every, um, every pair of nodes and you see which ones have the stronger springs and uh, collapse towards each other. Um, that's uh, that's a way of thinking about this, and and the the deal is, yeah, there are shows that if you weakened all the springs, they would look like they were watched by everybody. 
Yeah. Uh, and if you want to uh, look this up, it's published under the name GMAP. It's kind of a cool algorithm. Um, one of the things that, uh, that has changed the way people think about data and data analysis and made it interesting for individuals to think about is that uh, there's more data available to individuals than there used to be by a lot. You can get access to Twitter data, and uh, a lot of people do. A lot of people in this school uh, analyze Twitter data for uh, trying to predict financial market results, trying to predict a variety of other results. In this case, um, Twitter is being used to uh, identify a network event, a network outage, before the network knew about it. Uh, so it's an early indicator of what's going on on the network. Um, early indicator of a, of a variety of things. The, this kind of data is called uh, crowdsource data. Uh, what's going on here is uh, Twitter being used for crowdsource. Up here there's an application called Mark the Spot. Uh, that's what it's called if you have an AT&T phone. If you have a Verizon phone, it's called something else. Um, but basically, if anything goes wrong with your phone, you punch a button, cell phone. And uh, when it's next able to communicate with the network, it will uh, send a notification that some problem was occurring. So two sources which are effectively uh, generated by people doing something as opposed to transactions in the traditional way of getting data. And these turn out to be leading indicators. Um, in addition, there are various uh, health uh, devices. Uh, right now we don't see too many of them, but the picture there is from the University of Illinois. It's a patch which will measure your vital signs and communicate it to uh, a downstream <coughs> clinic uh, on a regular basis essentially data created from people using uh, devices and um, increasingly data created from devices which are simply sensors either connected to people or not. Um, what we see is uh, something called the Internet of Things in, in a variety of areas. There are probably um, a order of uh, several hundred million to a billion computers in the world, so classical computers, PCs, etc. There are order of uh, five or six billion wireless uh, devices in the world, uh, uh, personal phones. It's kind of bounded by the number of people in the world, some constant times the number of people in the world because it appears that a lot of people have, have many of these things. Uh, but that pales in comparison with the number of devices in the world that uh, have a variety of needs to, uh, to communicate. And uh, so if we look at the sensor networks, we'll, we'll see an enormous increase in the amount of data. And you can go to places like uh, cosm.com or data.gov, cosm.com or data.gov, and you'll essentially get data that's coming being thrown off by um, a variety of uh, sensor networks in the, in the case of COSIM or um, other kinds of networks in the case of, uh, of data.gov. Um, so it's not only people who are generating crowdsource data, but it's uh, environmental devices, energy devices, uh, etc. Real time is, is an important part of, um, of what's uh, changing in data analysis, and it changes the way you think about statistics and analysis, as well as the way you think about uh, data management. As I mentioned, you get to see only a window, and you need to make a decision on that window as to whether uh, there's some sort of event going on. Um, I've got a couple examples here. Uh, Mashable is a website that uh, takes votes on uh, people's favorite websites. And um, one of the more interesting um, real-time uh, sources of data is location data. 
So it comes off of GPSs if you have a cell phone and haven't locked it. Comes off a variety of other devices, your car, uh, all sorts of things. And uh, so this is just a list of the top five location uh, data users uh, from, from their recent uh, voting. Uh, there are, the point is there are hundreds of companies, small and large, who are now using location data for a variety of reasons. And location data by its nature uh, is typically used for real-time activity. If you're not there anymore, the, um, the location data is less interesting. So, uh, what you see here is a bunch of um, uh, applications such as if you're in a certain place, you can get uh, a variety of information. If you're near a store that offers um, radios, you may get coupons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are, um, we're, we're in the early days of location data because there are certain privacy issues. Uh, related to them, but um, it's a, a very fast-growing industry. Uh, this is another real, uh, real-time uh, device. It's a very stylish blue slipper. I'm sure you all wish you had one. Uh, what its role in life is is to predict whether you're going to fall in the next two to five minutes. So obviously mostly applied to, uh, to senior citizens. Uh, and the trials are going on right now at a, at a fairly large uh, nursing home. But uh, it's a good example of real-time real data because in fact if you uh, send it off to a database and find out about it 10 minutes later, it's of absolutely no use to you. Uh, by then, the fact of whether the person fell or not is, is known. Um, so the, the point of real-time data is to be able to do something typically analytically somewhat simpler than you might do in, in large data mining applications. Typically the, uh, the types of statistics are going to be a, a little bit simpler. They're going to be filters and uh, signature matching. Um, but extraordinarily valuable in, uh, in identifying things that affect the, the real world in the time that they're, uh, they're occurring. Uh, that example is um, a safety-related location-based. Uh, and so let me, I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'll pretty much skip by technology. Uh, on the left-hand side, so, for a period of about 30 years, from 1980 to, what would it be, maybe 20 years, 2000, there wasn't much activity in technology in data management. There was the relational databases, which came out in, uh, in roughly 1979 with Oracle, and then object-oriented databases, which didn't really take off. Uh, over the past 10 years, there's been an enormous amount of activity, largely driven by Google, Yahoo, Facebook, the usual suspects, because they couldn't do their jobs without them. And many of them open source now. So there are names of some of them up there. Uh, Hadoop is the base file system for many of them, but Cassandra, HBase, Google's Big Table, Mongo. A long list of these have fundamentally changed how data management is done and what the um, what the requirements are. I'll I'll only say that basically very often they loosen what are called the acid requirements for data management. At any rate, a lot of dynamism in how to do how to manage data at uh, at very large scale. Um, a lot of uh, work on managing streams. So in the slipper case, um, certainly in the location-based data case, if you put the data in a database, you lose. It's not that I have anything against databases, but the time it takes to get something into a database and then analyze it can be longer than the time you have to react to the data. So typically what you see is uh, systems that react to the data and simultaneously push it to a database for, for deeper analysis. Uh, 
Right now, the, the commercial world in uh, data streaming systems is just starting to, to build, mostly small companies, uh, although IBM, probably not a small company, is, is also involved with Infosphere. Joe talked a lot about uh, visualization last time, so I won't say much about that. And I've already said that uh, folks like um, <coughs> Facebook are working very hard on how to analyze graphs. Many, many companies are working very hard on how to analyze graphs, including the financials, the social networkers, and Facebook. And let me quickly finish, because I know you all have to go. There are a bunch of issues here that are not easy to deal with but that you have to be careful of, far more careful than you had to be in the transactional world of data. Security and privacy uh, are clearly two of them. You uh, can go on the web and get a long list of the companies who have been breached in security and lost a bunch of personal identifiable information. Um, large amounts of data are full of uh, inaccuracies, let me put it that way, full of things that are both inaccurate, deceiving, et cetera, et cetera. Just the nature of the beast. Um, the web is extreme in the sense that it's populated by, uh, in many cases, by people who have an interest in accuracies, but even machinery is going to develop, provide inaccuracies. And if you're doing something in real time, you don't have the time to um, have somebody look at it. And if you're doing something in the uh, few billion uh, a day, you don't have the time to look, have somebody look at it. So there's a lot of work going on in how to uh, manage the integrity of, of what you're seeing, how to do analysis that is robust in the face of the fact that you know there's going to be uh, problems. Um, I'm going to uh, skip by semantics because we're out of time. Uh, and I, I like it so much I can't talk for just a short amount of time on it. Uh, integration. Uh, everybody talks about the databases or the data flows that are 10 billion a day or 100 billion a day, et cetera. None of those are usable without two or three or five or 10 other databases which actually tell you what that data means as, as it comes across. So uh, data integration is a, um, is a really big issue. Think of it uh, in, in a public sense from, from the point of view of somebody like Google Analytics. They have search uh, data, they have email data, they have uh, location data in many cases from Google Maps, et cetera, et cetera. How does one put this together when there are not necessarily joins to put the stuff together? Um, and that's, um, that's an issue that uh, is, is kind of fun and interesting to think about and a challenge for any large data stream. Okay, I'm done. You suffered through this. So, uh, a couple things. One, um, the... Um, Analytics for, for things like multidimensional scaling, et cetera, for clustering to reduce what you have are, are becoming essential because you just can't deal with the whole thing in a, uh, uh, as a whole. Um, graph analytics, so, so people have been doing social networking analytics for the last, um, well, I think 1934 is the first paper I've seen on it. But, it's changed fundamentally uh, since then in, in terms of, um, one, the ability to, um, to do matrix multiplication at scale, but also the ability to actually do analytics to infer things of interest off of, uh, off of graphs. And I've already mentioned uh, streaming analytics, which, which are fundamentally changed. Those are three that, that come to mind. Um, I think one of the things I've seen is that visualization is being used as a precursor to analytics quite often now because uh, it's, a, it's a way of, of kind of getting a feel for what, what's happening. Thanks, Dave. Thank yep. you.